Hi, my name is Steven Sindoni. I'm your host for the ongoing series, Unexplained Mysteries. Today's episode is entitled, The Wilderness Hunter, which can be found in the book entitled, Mysteries of the Unexplained, published by Reader's Digest. Theodore Roosevelt was no pushover for a tall tale, but he was impressed by a story he recounted in his book, The Wilderness Hunter, published in 1893. The incident, which had occurred many years before, was related to Roosevelt, as the latter wrote, By a grizzled, weather-beaten old mountain hunter named Bauman, who was born and had passed all his life on the frontier, he must have believed what he said, for he could hardly repress a shudder at certain points of the tale. When the event occurred, Bauman was still a young man and was trapping with a partner among the mountains, dividing the forks of the salmon from the head of the Wisdom River. Not having had much luck, he and his partner determined to go up into a particularly wild and lonely pass through which ran a small stream set to contain many beaver. The pass had an evil reputation because the year before, a solitary hunter who had wandered into it was there slain, seemingly by a wild beast, the half-eaten remains being afterwards found by some mining prospectors only the night before. But Bauman and his partner were adventurous and untroubled by the tale. They made camp in a small glade and went upstream to set their traps. At dusk, the young men returned. They were surprised to find that during their short absence, something, apparently a bear, had visited camp and had rummaged about among their things, scattering the contents of their packs and in sheer wantonness destroying their lean-to. The footprints of the beast were quite plain but at first they paid no particular heed to them. Later they examined the tracks more closely and saw that the intruder had walked upright, but the footprints were not those of a human being. At midnight, Bauman was awakened by some noise and sat up in his blankets. As he did so, his nostrils were struck by a strong, wild beast odor, and he caught the loom of a great body in the darkness at the mouth of the lean-to. Grasping his rifle, he fired at the vague, threatening shadow, but must have missed, for immediately afterwards he heard the smashing of the underwood as the thing, whatever it was, rushed off into the impenetrable blackness of the forest and the night. The two men slept but little after that, and the next day stayed together as they worked. When they got back to camp, they saw that it had been again destroyed, and their camp kit and bedding tossed about. Two leg footprints showed plainly in the soft earth along the nearby stream. The trappers spent the night sitting by a blazing fire, one or the other on guard, listening uneasily to the sound of branches crackling and something uttering a harsh, grating, long-drawn moan, a peculiarly sinister sound. In the morning they decided to pick up their traps and leave that afternoon. They worked together as before until there were only three traps left yet to be collected. The sun was high, the traps were only a couple of miles from the camp, and the men agreed that Bauman would gather them while the other went back to the lean-to to pack their gear. There were three beavers in the traps, and it took Bauman some time to prepare them. With considerable uneasiness, he noted how low the sun was as he started for the campsite. At last, he came to the edge of the little glade where the camp lay, and he shouted as he approached it, but he got no answer. The campfire had gone out, though the thick blue smoke was still curling upwards. Near it lay the packs, wrapped and arranged. At first Bauman could see nobody, nor did he receive any answer to his call. Stepping forward, he again shouted, and as he did, so his eye fell on the body of his friend, stretched beside the trunk of a great fallen spruce. Rushing towards it, the horrified trapper found that the body was still warm, but that the neck was broken while there were four great fang marks in the throat. The footprints of the unknown beast creature, printed deep in the soft soil, told the whole story. The unfortunate man, having finished his packing, had sat down on the spruce log with his face to the fire and his back to the dense woods to wait for his companion. It had not eaten the body, but apparently had romped and gambled around it uncouth, ferocious glee, occasionally rolling over and over it, and had then fled back to the soundless depths of the woods. Bauman, utterly unnerved and believing that the creature with which he had to deal was something either half-human or half-devil, abandoning everything but his rifle 
and struck off at a speed down the paths, not halting until he reached the beaver meadows, where the hobble ponies were still grazing. Mounting, he rode onwards through the night until far beyond the reach of pursuit. This encounter with an ape-man in the wilderness of the Pacific Northwest left the young trapper so shaken that years later he still shuddered when he talked about it. Although Roosevelt himself had no similar experience during his years in the West, he did not seem to dismiss the story as far-fetched. I'd like to thank everyone for watching The Wilderness Hunter.